Uh, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, oh, hi Claire. Um, and welcome to everyone online as well. Uh, yeah, we've got quite an exciting evening planned. I actually don't really know what we're doing. Um, uh, Shantigarb is going to be leading the whole evening. He's going to be leading us in some meditation and then also talking some about his new book, The Burning House. Um, so yeah, I'm not, not going to say much more on that and let him, let him handle all that business. But I am just going to introduce Shantigarbha a little bit. Um, I don't know Shantigarbha that well, but uh, I have been, I also work for the Buddhist Center Online. Um, some of you may have done some of our online retreats and events in general. And uh, well, one of the courses that we've been running for the last eight weeks is the burning house that uh, Shantigarbha has been um, leading. Uh, yeah, for the last eight weeks, which is all it's a course that is based around this book, um, which is sort of a very sort of engaged Buddhist response to the environmental crisis that we that we kind of face at the moment. And uh, well, I've been very struck by that course, um, mostly because well, I've always I've really enjoyed Shantigarbha's emphasis on empathy. So empathy is always first, and um, whenever uh, often when we're faced with some of these really sort of difficult world problems, there can be really strong, strong reactions to certain things. And Shantika was always bringing it back, bringing it back to lived experience uh, and empathy, you know, always really strong with empathy, which I'm sure he'll say a lot about tonight. And uh, it seems quite fitting because, you know, we've just come off this um, period of time uh, exploring the life and work of Dr. Ambedkar, who, you know, comes this long line of lineage of really sort of engaged Buddhism. Uh, so it seems like really fitting for us to, to, to be uh, exploring this today. And I'm really excited to uh, find out what Chantagarbha has to, has to offer us today. So I, I think that's everything, uh, Kusala Deva. I don't know if you what, how want me to say anything else or? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thanks, Zach. Great. Okay, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Zach, for the intro. And thank you, Kusli Davy, for the introduction. So we're going to start with the meditation. So if you want to get comfortable to sit, and it'll be a customary 30, 35 minutes, this, this meditation. Is there somewhere I could see the people in the shrine room? Is that is that possible? Maybe it isn't. Would, at the moment, I can see the shrine, but not the people in the shrine. Yeah, have you got the shrine camera on tonight? Oh, there we go. It's turned around. <laughs> Thanks. It's so I can see if you're fidgeting. <laughs> okay. So, thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, yeah. So, if you want to get comfortable to sit, and if you're on, if you're on Zoom. You can switch your camera off if that's feel more comfortable to do that. And I'm going to lead through three qualities, developing three different qualities which seem to me important in this uh, situation that we find ourselves in: grounding, grief, and gratitude. Grounding, grief, and gratitude. So we'll start with a body scan and just find a way into that. But even before that, perhaps we could uh, salute the shrine. In the shrine room. So in call and response. Do you want me to do the response, Shantigarbha? Yes, please. Thanks. Yeah. The shrine. yeah. If we could just put our masks on for saluting in the shrine, that'd be great. Wherever mine, don't actually know where mine is. <laughs> it's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> Ready when you are. Namo Buddhaya. Namo Buddhaya. Namo Dhammaya. Namo Dharmaya. Namo Sanghaya. Namo Sanghaya. Namo. 
Grounding, grief and gratitude. When you're ready, gathering your attention and bringing it within the envelope of your skin. To get an overall sense of your body. And allowing your attention to trickle down your torso, down your legs, to the feet and the toes. Picking up sensations in the toes. Any tingliness. The soles of the feet. Heels and ankles. Calves and knees. thighs and sitting bones. Feeling your weight going down evenly through the sitting bones to the chair or the cushion, into the floor, ultimately into the earth. Allowing the earth to take your weight. Noticing the pelvis and lower back. Upper back. Spreading into the shoulder blades. And down the arms, to the elbows, forearms, and hands with fingers and thumbs. Sensing the life in your hands.
from the fingertips, from the palms, warm or cool, dry or moist, tingly or numb. And when you're ready, bring your attention to your stomach, to your belly. Noticing any swirls of tension. Any areas of ease and relaxation in your belly. Coming through to your lower back again. And following the spine upwards. Between the shoulder blades. To your neck and head. And if it helps, allowing the muscles at the back of the neck, at the base of the skull, relax and lengthen. Noticing the scalp and ears. Forehead and eyes. Nose and mouth. chin and throat, and chest with heart and lungs. And dropping in on the breath, following your breath, Eight to ten breaths.
And when you're ready, sensing what you're feeling at the moment. So checking in around the heart. Perhaps lower down, perhaps further up. Sensing what you're feeling. And sensing if this feeling has a color associated with it. Or an image. Or a sound. or a texture. Even a taste or a smell. A posture or a gesture. And when you're ready, following this feeling back to its source. Back to what you're longing for. What are you longing for at the moment? What's your heart's wish? Now we can explore more fully grounding in the four elements. So we've already connected with the earth element. 
allowing the earth to take our weight. Sensing the earth element in our body and in the earth beneath us. sense of solidity, of groundedness. That gives us shape and definition. It pulls us towards the earth. And we've also been exchanging with the air element. Noticing the air coming in and going out of our lungs. Process of constant exchange. We're breathing in the oxygen rich air that's breathed out by plants and plankton. And the carbon dioxide that we breathe out is food those same plants and plankton. So we're in a constant exchange with the air. And then, of course, there's the water element. Many times a day, we take in liquids. Which we hold in our bodies as flesh, saliva, tears, urine, and so on. And many times a day we breathe out that uh, the water, the moisture, We let it out in other ways, through urine, through sweat, saliva, through tears, and so on. So we're in a constant exchange, process of constant exchange with the water element.
finally in this guided reflection there's the fire element so we take in the warmth around us ultimately coming from the sun we take it in in terms of the sun's sun's rays or drinks or food or heating contact with others the warmth that keeps our bodies alive when we very carefully regulate our temperature our core temperature through clothing eating exercise and so on So we're in a constant dialogue with the fire element, with warmth, especially at this time of year. So we don't need to go looking for it. We are connected with the earth, with the elements. We are part of the earth. The earth is part of us. with this sense of groundedness, both in our experience and a connection with the earth, we could explore our feelings in relation to the earth. We feel some sadness about the earth that we're handing on to the next generation. It's worth giving it some space because it might be creating some overwhelm. In this perspective, grief is an aspect of compassion. If we feel sad, it's a sign that we care about the earth, we care for the earth.
the heart that, that breaks open can hold the whole world. And our love and care for the earth can remind us of what we feel grateful for in relation to the earth. So what do you feel grateful for? Being alive on this earth. When did nature stop you in your tracks with its richness and abundance? Its color. its vastness. Its intricacy. It's sheer beauty. Perhaps remembering a place that you loved as a child.
What opportunities has life afforded you? Opportunities for growth and development and learning. As well as love and freedom. Creativity. Is there someone or something, perhaps the Dharma, that's encouraged you and supported you to fulfill your potential? And in a minute, I'm going to ring a bell to bring this guided reflection to a close. So just finishing off in whatever way you choose. I believe it's customary to have a tea break at this point, so 
when you're ready, opening your eyes and looking around, taking in the others in the room. And what time should we come back? Uh, come back out, please, Lou David. We'll be back. And we'll come back just before 25 past, so we're ready to start again at 25 past. Okay. So just noticing that you've got um, Dr. Ambedkar on, on, still on the shrine. Uh, so perhaps I'd just mention briefly Dr. Ambedkar. So um, those of you who are doing the uh, Mitra study module on Dr. Ambedkar will know that he um, was born into uh, what is now called a well Dalit uh, family. So regarded as out of the caste system, an outcast, out of an untouchable. And he uh, was very, very fortunate in he got a, an education, he was sponsored in his education, and he returned to India as a very highly qualified lawyer, and he formulated the Indian constitution. The first, when India gained its independence, he formulated, he framed the constitution on the basis of equality, fraternity, and freedom. So liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now you may think, many people think, that the, these are the ideals of the French Revolution, and of course they are. However, Dr. Ambedkar said that he got these uh, qualities, these values, from the Buddha. From the Buddha, from his master, the Buddha, he said. So this may come as a surprise, because in the West, Buddhism tends to be, fr be framed or um, presented in terms of psychological understanding or psychological insights, uh, personal development and so forth. So it may come as a surprise that uh, in India, and particularly uh, amongst uh, the Tri Ratna movement uh, in India, it has a very, very different profile. It's uh, very much about social uplift. About it's about uh, personal and uh, social development. So Dr. Ambedkar is a very important uh, reference point for us in our tradition. He's part of our tradition. He's on our shrine, as you can see. Uh, for somebody who who was exploring the connection between the personal and the social, so transforming self and world, as uh, Bhante says, as Ergin Sangharachita says in. Uh, his commentary on the Sutra of Golden Light, transforming self and world, not just one, not just the other. Yeah. And I think in the context of the climate and ecological emergency, it's worth bearing in mind that we, we do have some reference points in, in our tradition, some important reference points about how we can understand and integrate and make sense of the movement between uh, self-development self and social change. However, I'd like to start in a slightly different place, which is to read out um, a quote that somebody sent to me. Um, one of um, Bounty's literary executors sent to me today. So this is Vidya Davy sent it to me. So I put it in the chat. Um, um, but I'll read it out for those of you in the throne room. And I'd like you to guess where it comes from. Another matter that I felt quite concerned about recently is the environment. It does seem that human beings are destroying our own environment and it may be that in the next 20 years very serious damage will be done to the total environment of life on earth. One reads dreadful things about the destruction of the rainforests and of all sorts of species of living things. To me it seems dreadful that thousands of beautiful species of animals, fish, birds and butterflies are just being wiped out each year. We need to take a much stronger stand on such issues and perhaps play a more active part, at least in our individual capacities, in the environmental movement. This is completely in accordance with the principles of Buddhism. As Buddhists, we're urged to... I lost my place. As Buddhists, we are urged to direct metta towards all living beings, 
and that and that doesn't just mean all human beings but all animals insects plants birds and life of every kind so this is the basis of our ecological concern we wish all beings well and then he goes on to explain It's in our own interest to do so, because we can't live on a naked planet. We can't live on rock and sand. We depend on vegetation and animal life. We're all interconnected. Another great lesson from Buddhism. In the next 20 years, I would like to see the order developing an ecological dimension. And I would like to see some order members working in this field on the basis of their Buddhist commitment. Perhaps in some cases working alongside non-Buddhists who share this concern. And then he finishes by saying, because this is something of very, very basic importance. So who said this? So order members, I, if you could just hold on for a minute, because you probably have more of an idea. But So... In the chat, please, if you're on Zoom, or if there's some way you can let me know from the, if you have any clues from the Shrine Room, that would also be helpful. Who said this? Any guesses? Rachel says Banti. Okay, so Ergyan Sangharachada. Yes, it was Ergyan Sangharachada who said this. Any idea when or what was the audience? All the members can join in now if you want to. Audience or date, occasion, and again, it'd be really helpful to have something from the shrine room. I don't know if you know. I'd like, I'd like, I'd like to include the shrine room in, in some way. If you have any ideas, we've uh, we we've guessed the correct name, but okay. uh, if. Does anyone want to guess uh, a year? Or an audience or an occasion? I feel like it's going to be surprisingly early, like the 80s maybe. Connor's saying he thinks it might be surprisingly early, like maybe the 80s or... 1988. Pretty good guess. <laughs> <laughs> occasion, audience? No, nobody's wanting to hazard a guess. Well, the audience was, was the order. He was speaking to the order. And the occasion was the order's 20th birthday. So on the order's 20th birthday, this was one of the things that, the, that Banti said to the order. He said a lot of things on that occasion, and it's well worth looking at all of them, because uh, many of them are just as insightful or, and prescient as, as this bit. Yeah? However, this is the bit we're interested in today, because in 1988, he was saying, well, species are disappearing, habitats are disappearing. Yeah? He could, he, I doubt he could have predict, predicted just how much of a snowball that would, be, would have been, that would be since 1988, in terms of species loss and uh, increase in CO2 concentrations and so on. So how do you feel? when you hear Banti's words today, when you hear me reading out Banti's words, how do you feel? So I'd like to hear feeling words, please, in the chat, please, if you're on Zoom. And also maybe Zach, if you could gather a few feeling words and, and say them into the mic so we could hear some from the shrine room as well, please. I'm guessing there'll be a variety of different feelings hearing these. Mm. Rachel says sad, Sarah says depressed, Corey concerned, Issa sad, Joanne anxious, Claire heartbroken. In, in the Shrine Room, uh, Jerry said sad but also inspired. Oh, oh inspired but also a bit depressed. Okay. <laughs> I was quite keen on that combo. Okay, yeah, yeah. What have we got? Sheeta says, good for the future. Ma Ma Michael says, concerned but motivated. Steve says, exasperated. 
Kate says bewildered. Okay, so quite a variety of different feelings. Overwhelms his guy. Quite a variety of different feelings coming up when we hear about these words and we sort of get a sense of where we are in relation to 1988 and, and, and so on. Yeah, and still this strong current of care for the earth, of care for all beings. That's why we're here, you know, that's what, that's our province, if you like, see what, it, or our kind of, I don't know quite what the word is, but all beings, that's, that's what we're connected with. That's what we relate. That's what we relate to, all beings as Buddhists. You know, that's our constituency. That sounds a bit electoral, doesn't it? But anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. Yeah. So, as the recent IPCC report um, in August and many reports before that confirms. The Earth is in a climate and ecological emergency. There, well, in fact, there are multiple emergencies, and I choose my words carefully when I talk about emergencies. Uh, and anthropogenic greenhouse gases are the cause of those, of, of, uh, of, of many of those uh, emergencies, crises. Also, obviously, appropriation of land by humans for farming and other uses uh, has impacted. Uh, habitats all over the world. Unless there are immediate, rapid and large scale reductions in greenhouse gases, limiting warming to 1.5 degrees or even 2 degrees is beyond reach. In fact, um, I, I just, I checked after the recent COP, COP26, uh, what impact COP26 had made on, on the scientific estimates of where, we, where we're heading by, by 2100. And all the discussions and agreements of COP26 brought that estimate down from 2.7 degrees to 2.4 degrees, according to Carbon Action Tracker, uh, which is a, a, a reliable uh, um, project which, which puts all the information in about what's likely to happen and policies and so forth and promises, promises and policies and yeah, 2.4 degrees by 2100. We've, we've increased by just over one degree since uh, the Industrial Revolution, the start of the Industrial Re Revolution, and scheduled to go up to 2.4 degrees. By anybody, by, in any playbook, that is catastrophic. And I, again, I choose my words very carefully here. Catastrophic in the sense of impact on um, sea levels, impact on weather patterns, impact on food production, impact on wars and displacements of people as a result of uh, uh, scarcity, uh, climate, changing climate, uh, people moving to areas where there is farming to be had, um, extreme weather and so on. So I, I feel I feel I feel that's a bleak prospect. I feel bleak when I when I consider that. I don't know if that's quite a feeling. I feel concerned in a really bleak kind of way when I sort of when I take that into account. And I just yeah. Uh, so it makes it clear to me that no one gets to sit this one out. We just can't sit long enough and wait for this to blow over. It's not, none of us can sit that long. It's going to continue for the next years, decades, possibly centuries. We don't know. Just the impact of our, of our collective actions, collective carbon emissions so far. So clearly, there's a spiritual aspect to this crisis. From a Dharmic perspective, it can be seen as a crisis of empathy. And Zach mentioned empathy. So, well, well, I would frame it in terms of a crisis of empathy because I wrote a book on empathy and that's my, that's my main subject, empathy. It's like, uh, just our, and in, in this context, empathy is our moral imagination, our ethical imagination. It's our capacity to imagine the impact of our actions on others. 
and in particular to imagine the impact of our collective actions on, on others. So that's what I mean by empathy in this context. It's a crisis of ethical imagination. And no meaningful systemic shift is possible without a corresponding shift in consciousness. If we want those changes, those social, that social change, we also need to address uh, a, a shift in consciousness. We need to uh, be, be paying attention to a shift in consciousness. So how can the Buddha's teachings support us to face this situation, to take responsibility and to act proportionately? What would a Buddhist response to the climate and ecological emergency look like? What would it sound like? What would it feel like? So this is what I wanted to explore in, uh, in my book. And to do this, um, I'd like to go back to 2019 and to Greta Thunberg. Uh, and she said, she told the world's leaders several times, I want you to act as if your house was on fire. And this took me right back to Mitra study and to the White Lotus Sutra and to the parable of the burning house in the White Lotus Sutra. I want you to act as if your house was on fire. Hmm, I've heard that before somewhere. So in the parable, the, there's a father who has many children, up to 30 apparently, and he lives in this big old ramshackle house made of wood. And he comes back one day and the house is on fire. And the house is, the, the fire is really caught has really caught uh, light and the, the roof beams are burning and then a neighbor comes up to him and says your children are in the house so of course he's really sort of worried about this really worried he realizes he, there are too many children to, to go in there and grab and pull out so so he tries yelling he, yelling to them he says the house is on fire the house is on fire come out, come out as quickly as you can. And of course, what happens? They take no notice at all. Absolutely no notice. They just carry on playing with their games. They're very happy with their games, actually. They've got plenty of games. They've got games which will keep them busy all day, every day. Yeah? So... He, he, so, well, he doesn't know what to do. You know, he's got no idea what to do now. You know, he's uh, terrified. And then he has a flash of inspiration. He knows what kind of toys all these different, his, his children like, each one of them likes. So he, so he calls to each one of them and he says, hey, I've got this amazing toy. These amazing toys out here, even better than the ones on TV. And you can play with them in for you can play with them till bedtime. So at this, when they hear this, well, what do you think happens? Any guesses? They fight each other to get out of the house. They push, they push each other, they jostle each other to see who can get out of the house first. So a totally different response. When he, when he offers them or when he offers them something that he knows that they like, a particular thing that he knows that they like, they're running to get out of the house. And of course, once they're out of the house, they're safe. And then he gives them all a beautiful toy, an amazing, wonderful toy, even better than anything they could imagine, he says in the, in the story. Now, in the parable, so I like parables because they work on different levels. And, and you can, it enables you to think creatively about an issue by looking at these different levels and moving between these different levels of, of, the, of the parable. So in the parable, the house is sangsara. The house represents sangsara. And the flames that are consuming the house represent... Anybody? In the chat or... Um, in the shrine room, what do the flames represent? Dharma Geeks quiz. In the chat, please. 
or or Zach or or funnel it through Zach. Yeah, we got a few people shouting out Ducker or impermanence. Mm. Mm. Anything? Yeah. Anything more specific? Attachment or belongings. Attachment over belongings. Mm. Aaron said as well. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Paula in the chat says lack of compassion, question mark. Rachel, she's on the nail. Greed, hatred and delusion. So the flames represent greed, hatred and delusion. The flames which are consuming the house are greed, hatred, the three poisons, as Karen Avarsha says. Yes. Okay. So now, so transposing the, the parable and that, that meaning to the current climate and ecological situation, we're faced with a burning world. The world is quite literally heating up and burning because of our, our collective actions. And the flames are, any guesses? What do you reckon? What are the flames? From a Dharmic perspective, what are the flames? The same. They're the same. They're the same flames. Might be 2,000 years later or whatever. You know, but the flames are the same. Greed, hatred and ignorance. So there's an interesting parallel there. Interesting parallel there. So we're, we're faced with a burning world, or heating up and obviously wildfires and so forth, but overheating, basically. Overheating, you know, we're, we're overheating the atmosphere in, in different ways. So how do we get people out of a burning house when they're unaware of the danger? That's the crunch question. So now it'd be nice to think that we're the, we're the father calling into the house. You know, it, that'd be nice to, it'd be nice to think we could position ourselves in that kind of way. However, I suspect it's not really like that. I suspect that we're the children in the house and it's the scientists who are calling to us, telling us about the situation. And we're the ones, and we're not taking any notice. However, let's just go with the idea that we're, 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 the, we're in the position of the father and we're trying to get some people out of the house to save them, to save their lives. So how are we going to do it? When they're unaware of the danger. And bear in mind that the children, um, the children don't even know what, what a house is. They don't even know what danger is. So when the father is trying to speak to them, communicate with them about house on fire, danger, it's like, what? Yeah. So how are we going to speak to them in a, in a, in a language which will make sense? So one way that has been tried already is the, the cry of anguish, the father's cry of anguish. So he yells out, you know, the house is on fire, you're in danger, get out, come out, come out. And of course, this has very limited appeal. Uh, it's been tried the last 20, 30 years. It seems to have very, very limited appeal to, to people's imagination and, and to action on, on, a, on, on a wide scale. So our equivalent would be to invoke self-preservation. So, well, you're going to die if you don't get out, you're going to die. Or even just uh, to say, well, do it for others. Again, seems to have very limited appeal. Now, uh, I'm not saying it has limited appeal here. I'm just saying that generally on a wide scale, it seems to have very limited appeal. Then the father tries this cry of inspiration. And of course, this is much more successful. So I'd like to explore this cry of inspiration. So what could be our equivalent cry of inspiration in relation to the climate and ecological emergency? What could be our equivalent cry of inspiration in relation to the climate and ecological emergency? So we need a compelling vision of life outside of that burning house. A compelling vision of the Dharma that's going to lead that's going, to, that's going to be attractive in a, in a way that people will want to come out of the house. So what's that going to be? 
So I suggest we go into groups of three. So Councillor Davy, could you put us in groups of three on Zoom? And Zach, could you invite everybody in the tri room to go into groups of three and just spend five minutes um, exploring what's going to be your cry of, or our cry of inspiration? What's going to do the job to get people out of this burning house? Shantigarbha, do you want to be in a group? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so we come back in five minutes and we'll compare notes about this crime. Make it six, actually. Make it six. Okay, welcome back. So let's let's hear some of these, some of these cries of inspiration. So Zoom people, online people in the chat, please. And Zach, if you could also uh, unmute, and we could, if we could hear some from the shrine room as well, please. Yeah, there's lots of lots of chatter in the shrine room. <laughs> I'll pick out some responses. Are there any responses for Chantagarba? Call out, and I'll repeat it to him. Any responses? No, it was considered by way of kind of meditation teachings and things like this. Kind of, because we've seen a lot of kind of yoga classes and certain mindfulness, things like that. But as an extension to that, we could offer our own kind of come and learn to meditate without the Buddhist bit, but offer that as well. Kind of, okay, we've taught you to meditate now, you, you know the mindfulness of breathing, you know the meta bhavana. Here's everything else you could have, and here's all the benefits that could have. It's there, but not pushed, if that can make sense. Let people find it on their own. So, yeah, so we've got a response from Connor. I don't know if you heard any of that. I didn't catch it all. So if you could just summarise, please. Yeah, so I guess Connor was sort of saying, and just let, stop me if I'm, if I'm catching this right, but like you were sort of off, saying, sort of offering meditation from a secular perspective broadly, broadly to the community or something, wider community in terms of giving tools, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's right, but kind of... I don't know if you want to come up here, maybe just use the mic, that might just be easier. Uh, just hold it. Yeah. Uh, so the idea was uh, that we're seeing a big rise in kind of Eastern wisdom, yoga, secular mindfulness, things like that that's becoming quite popular. Mm -hmm. um, so, and obviously these are tools that uh, we have quite a lot of, this, it came from our tradition, mm -hmm. uh, uh, broadly speaking, so we could offer something fairly similar, kind of meditation classes, things like this, mm -hmm. either in community halls or at work, things like this, without necessarily pushing the spiritual side of it, but at the same time offering the spiritual side, you know, this is where this wisdom comes from, this is where these, this meditation comes from, mm -hmm. and here are the benefits you could have for doing all of the other stuff as well if you're interested if not at least you've got these tools here if mm -hmm. that makes sense okay. thank you what i'm hearing there is 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 um offering a vision of higher states of consciousness uh of uh, more metaphor more aware states of consciousness and here are some tools which are going to help to do that yeah thank you let's see what we've got in the chat uh, offering connection, says Kuslo Davy. Uh, yeah, connection. Uh, Karen Navarcha says, yes, a sense of community and connection. Yes, and I, I asked this question in Brighton at the Brighton Buddhist Center, and uh, a venerable order member called Dharma Bandhu, he said, he didn't say much, but what he said was so profound. He just said something like this, and I'll try and do it the way he did it. He said, well, we need to come together about this, you know? We need to come together. We need to, we, I do, and, and the way I understand that, that is we need to put our heads and our hearts together to address this, you know? So that's where uh, community and connection comes from. And of course, that sense of collaboration, that sense of community is very precious to people, you know? It's a sangha jewel, you know? 
And we have we 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 can offer that jewel. We can offer that 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 jewel, that beautiful thing, that beautiful precious thing of community, and coming together around this issue and uh, addressing it, taking stock and checking what resources we have to address it. Uh, Guy says, I agree with that. Also, if we cut down our consumption of consumption and frantic work habits we'd have much more free time. Okay, so quality of life. So the vision is quality of life, well-being there. And of course, there's a whole kind of well-being industry nowadays, you know, so, so it's it's familiar, you know, the whole kind of thing about, well, increasing quality of life, you know, that we could look forward to, in, to increase quality of life. And uh, there's a, a lovely little study that was done during lockdown uh, in, a, in an area of Wales that found that people's quality of life went up during lockdown rather than down. And the reason for that was they were thrown back on themselves and on their community and on each other. So they felt their sense of community much more strongly during that time when they were sort of semi-isolated from the rest of the world. They felt that sense of community, community much more keenly during lockdown. So their quality, overall quality of life went up, even though they were suffering the hardships and you know, the, the inconveniences of, of, of lockdown during that time. So this, is, you know, this sort of suggests the importance of community and you know, uh, collective mu mutuality, something like that. Um, what have we got here? Uh, Kate says, yes, Connor, I agree. Making secular mindfulness available and offering a taste of waking up Okay, yeah, just just meta and mindfulness, just uh, the, those the beauty, the beauty that comes, and the transformation, the quality of life that comes from uh, embodying those qualities. Lisa says, embodying a vision of a better world through connection. Okay, yeah. Uh, Corey, we spoke about how people maybe needed role models that they can relate to, who lead by example, and people need to be assured that every little helps. One person won't change anything seems to be a common mindset around the issue. I also think a sense of community needs to be emphasized, but one that people can relate to, perhaps through drawing comparison to their personal lives. Yeah, yeah. So there's this strong sense in, in our society that, well, you know, what can I do? I'm just one person, what can I do? And it, it's, it, sort of, it comes out of a kind of nihilistic mindset that uh, actions don't have consequences, least of all mine, you know? So uh, it also actually, um, it means we, we, we don't, we, we, we feel disempowered, we feel helpless, he hopeless and helpless, this kind of mindset, you know? And I think to some extent that's to do with the Western, Western mindset, which, which is to some extent characterized by nihilism, but also perhaps consumerism, that we expect to consume. If we have the resources, we can buy in whatever we need for our satisfactions. Other than that, what the hell, who cares, you know? So, so there's, I think there's something about that kind of consumerism, uh, consumerist mindset, which means we, we're, we, 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 we tend towards passivity. We tend towards inaction and passivity and, and helplessness. So these are various things to consider. How, how growing up in this particular society impacts that sense of empowerment. Any other cries of inspiration? Any more from the Shrine Room? Just checking with you, Zach. <laughs> yep, just picking up the microphone. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny you should mention community, actually, because in our group we were talking a lot about actually like the spiritual community being sort of that nucleus for a new society that sort of Sangraksha talks about, mm -hmm. sort of being an example in in our, in our way, in some ways being a sort of fourth sight for people, mm -hmm. um, and seeing that that people can that you can be in a context ideally with people that are just trying to 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 live by the you know the sort of the five precepts the ten precepts you know trying to live ethical lives and people and trying to live simple lives mm -hmm. so it sort of felt like uh 
yeah, that just uh, that feeding the spiritual community and trying to live uh, uh, fully in the spiritual community was a really good was a really important example of that for the world, you know. And then there was also this feeling of like wanting to then align up with other groups of similar values, because not knowing that knowing that not everyone would become Buddhist necessarily or mm. or even practice within Sri Ratna, but mm. uh, rather that just in a way, just our community being known amongst those other sort of radical groups and mm. uh, people that, yeah, just people that are trying to live moral lives, you know. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of things there. One is walking the talk or being, you know, be modeling, being the change we wish to see in the world, as uh, Gandhi said. So yeah, we can we can we can make that change. We can live the life that we want we want we want to live, and we would we'd like to see that change in the world. Yeah. And the second one is uh, the whole kind of finding common ground with with uh, other people who have similar concerns, as Banti said in his uh, in the twenty years uh, in, in his talk to the to the order in nineteen eighty eight, and. Uh, in Glasgow at COP26, I did a, a, an interfaith presentation. I talked, I talked as a Buddhist, however, to Christians and others, mainly Christians, Christians and Buddhists. And I was trying to find common ground. I was really trying to uh, establish common ground, uh, a common ground on which we were all present and, and explore that with them. And I wrote on the, on the flip chart, I wrote, care for the earth, seems an obvious channel for acting with compassion in the world. And that's on page three of, uh, of my book, The Burning House. Care for the earth seems an obvious channel for acting with compassion in the world. And we just explored that for 20 minutes or so. And I'm, I said, well, obviously, compassion isn't a, isn't a uniquely Buddhist virtue. You know, people from other traditions, other faiths also uh, value uh, and want to develop compassion and care for the earth is a way of, 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 of acting on that sense of compassion and we explored that in a very relaxed and kind of uh, uh, collaborative way for, for, for 20 minutes that, 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 that quote and we found actually that we had a lot of common ground so you know we could we could explore um, um, and work together uh, through, through, through that. So any other cries of inspiration? Well, depends on the age group. I think, I think there are different, so different appeals might make sense to different groups. So for instance, as we get older, people might, uh, might be more interested in being good ancestors. You know, as you get older, you might be more interested in, well, what kind of world are you handing on to the next generation? So. So, well, you know, being good ancestors, our children will thank us for it, or the next generation will thank us for it if we take responsibility, if we stand up and take responsibility in this generation. Yeah? Whereas people who are, who are younger, people who, are, uh, who have most of their life ahead of them, perhaps they'd be, they might be more motivated by, by, well, what kind of future are they heading towards? You know, and and uh, a picture of the future. You know, perhaps maybe well-being, a sense of well-being, maybe uh, quality of life, community, uh, being part of the solution, being part of the you know the addressing the issues, being part of the solution, and so on. Yeah. So there might be a number of different appeals. I don't imagine that there's one appeal. There's one size fits all. Yeah. However, I do want to pick up on a very specific uh, Buddhist teaching, Dharma, Dharma, Dharmic teaching, which I think is particularly important here, uh, which is interconnectedness. I think, I think there's a lot that we can do here. Uh, you know, we don't need to go off the pitch in any kind of way, in you know, the pitch of the Dharma, in order to explore, explore this topic fully. Um, with inter interconnectedness, the teaching of interconnectedness. We can wake up to the truth of interconnectedness, that things emerge in dependence upon conditions and that actions have consequences. And uh, in the Avatamsaka Sutra, um, there's the image of Indra's net. 
who's come across the image of Indra's neck? Can you give me a thumbs up if you've heard of come across Indra's neck? People on people on Zoom have. Zach in the in the shrine room, can you give me an idea of how many people have what percentage have come across Indra's net? Um, yeah, I got about three or four hands up out of about eleven people. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so I'll say I'll just mention it briefly. This Indra's net. So Indra was the king of the gods in Indian mythology, and so he was rather like Zeus in the ancient Greek uh, pantheon, and he owned a magnificent net so large that it stretched indefinitely in all directions. And in accordance with his uh, divine and kingly tastes, the maker of this net had tied a jewel, a glittering jewel into each of the nodes, into each of the knots of the net. Since the net was infinite in dimension, the jewels were infinite in number. So, Perhaps if you might like to close your eyes just to imagine this and just imagine the night sky. We'll do the night sky, okay? So night sky, clear night, very little or no light pollution. You're looking up and you can start to see the, see the stars. And as you look, you can see more and more stars coming out of the darkness. Till eventually you can see the whole panoply of the heavens. Only tonight, if we take a closer look at any of these stars, each of them is emitting light and each of them is reflecting all the other stars. All the other stars in the sky which are infinite in number. Each of, the jewel, each of the stars or each of the jewels is reflecting all the other stars, all the other jewels, so that the process of reflection is itself infinite. And this is an image of the cosmos in which there's an infinitely repeated relationship amongst all the constituents. And the relationship is characterized by one of simultaneous mutual intercausality, or as we know, dependent arising. And we can apply this image directly to our current climate and ecological emergency because it's an ecological image, it's an ecological understanding. If any of the jewels become cloudy, if any of the stars become cloudy, they reflect the other stars less clearly. If any ecological niche in our environment becomes polluted, that impacts the other niches. A loss of habitat or species in one area affects the rest of the environment, the rest of the, the ecology. It turns out that life on Earth is dependent on the biosphere, which is about 20 kilometers wide at its furthest extent, between the deepest oceans and the, the atmosphere, the, the height of, of the atmosphere where life can survive. It's about 20 kilometers thick, a little thin strip that goes around the surface of the Earth. And that's what we're reliant on. What we put into the earth, sorry, what we put into the atmosphere here in the UK, in Nottingham or Bristol, soon finds its way to Moscow, Beijing, Atlanta, Auckland, and so on. So the environment, the biosphere, is a beautiful living Indra's net. And we can use that kind of ecological understanding both to communicate Buddhism, communicate the Dharma, but also to understand, uh, to have an ecological understanding, to understand things in an ecological, the way an ecologist understands it. 
Likewise, if rivers are cleaned and wetlands restored, life across the environment is enhanced. And this net of conditions accounts not only for physical and biological factors, but also for human intentions. In fact, human intentions are critical in determining what happens to the net, to Indra's net. We're interconnected. Our actions matter and our actions arise from our states of mind. So this is where states of mind become very important, where we need to pay attention to the states of mind upon which we act. So I'll just pause there for a moment. So what's coming up for you, hearing this about Indra's net? So in the chat, please, uh, and Zach, if you could collect a few responses. What's coming up for you now? How are you feeling now? What's coming up for you now? One or two sentences, please, if you're online, rather than the, the uh, extended version. So I can hear. Corey says clarity. Claire is, is very inspired. Very, oh, thank you. Loves that image. She's got quite a face on, actually. <laughs> I wish I could see it. I yeah. Wish I, see, I could see the try. <laughs> She's saying, no, you don't. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. Maybe don't. Uh, Karen of Archer says, a vast and compassionate vision of reality that can give us the strength and inspiration to stand up and act, capital letters. Paula says, eyes opened. Sheetal says, positive, motivated. Yeah, there's something kind of beautiful about that image, about the image of Indra's net. And we need that beauty. We need that sense of love and beauty. Because otherwise, we're not going to be motivated to act, to protect, to protect the earth and, and, and the, the, um, our fellow inhabitants. And this is where David Attenborough, God bless his cotton socks, comes in. Because David, you know, in almost every conversation that I have with people about um, about this, about cries of inspiration, people mention David Attenborough and they mention the beauty of the programs that he's, uh, that he's been uh, involved in. Beautiful images. And we need that sense of love, that sense of, uh, oh, this is really worth saving. This is really worth keeping. Otherwise, we're not going to be motivated to, 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 you know, to, to, to protect it. Kate says hope. Lisa says interconnectivity, a shared risk, creates a sense of community. Yeah, if we have a sense, well, we're, this is we we risk losing this collectively, then that 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 creates community. A collective hardship and shouldering the burden. Yeah, so this is another lesson from 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 lockdown, which is people don't mind shouldering a portion of the collective burden if the payoff is a sense of community, if they get a stronger sense of community as a payoff, let's say Sangha, yeah? They don't mind that. They don't mind enduring hardships, even quite hard, you know, even quite difficult hardships, if they have a sense of that they're part of something greater, the, the, you know, yeah? So therein lies much of my hope. Any other reflections? on this bit. Okay, so yeah, I'd like to finish with a, well, I, we're, we're, we're gonna chart, do a chant, just a little, little bit of chanting just to finish. We'll do Sabe Sata Suki Hontu, which I think is particularly relevant here. May all beings be happy and well. 
and all beings be free from suffering. Let me just check the chat for a minute. Uh, I missed a bit earlier where Paula said, listening to the wisdom of those who enrich the environment they inhabit rather than degrade. Okay, so a vision of, we did know, used to know how to do this. We did used to know how to live in harmony or to, to be sustainable in our environment. We lost that knowledge or that awareness somewhere along the line, but the, at least a vision that, that it, it is possible. We can live in harmony with the, the natural environment. Okay, so yeah, what kind of ancestors do we want to be? What kind of ancestors do we want to be? Maybe just take a moment to reflect on that. Okay, so we'll finish with Sabe Sata Suki Hantu. Uh, two or three minutes, and then we'll close. Sabe Sata Suki Hantu. Sabe Sata. Suki Hantu Sabe Sata 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 Suki Hantu Okay, so back to Kusla David, I guess, or Zach.
you there in the shrine room, Zach? I think Jerry was just going to say something to finish us off. Ah, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hi, just, yeah, I just want to say, obviously, a great deal of gratitude for that really moving, moving talk and really wonderful meditation as well. I actually was moved to tears, I have to say, so thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about Dana um, very quickly. Very quickly. Um, tonight, it's not about actually gifting to the Buddhist Centre and gifting to our local community. It's um, very much about recognising the time that's been given up for us tonight and the book that is available for us to purchase. So um, we have only got one, unfortunately, here at the centre. Um, there are some more coming. Yeah, <laughs> um, sorry? Yeah, this is They've been sold already. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Are we getting more? Uh, yes. Yes, good stuff. And um, we did mention that maybe if people are interested in one, that they could put the name down. So it might be an idea. So we've got an idea how many I wanted. But Dana for this evening is very much about encouraging everybody to to buy the book. So thank you again. Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. So for those online, I've also added a link to the book. Uh, yeah, which you can buy at Windhorse, but we will have more at the centre in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So, yeah, just a huge thank you, Shanti Garba, um, for a very beautiful, stimulating evening. Um, yeah, for getting us thinking, getting us together and inspiring us to act. Yeah. Thank you very much. Chris Levy, could I just add one thing to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, just to mention that we do have an Earth Sangha circle that's started mm -hmm. very recently in Nottingham. So if you're inspired tonight to um, to join us, then please just email into the center and we'll we'll add you in. Yeah, or we'll get in touch with any of us and just ask ask to be added. Yeah, wonderful. There's everyone in the shrine room. Hiya. Ah, <laughs> oh, good. Great, thank you very much. So feel free to unmute and 